Thank you, Chairman. Um, let me ask you a question. Um, how many regulations are there out there that a small company that wants to go public uh, that they have to apply to? How, how many apply? Do you have yeah. Um, I can try with that. The, for a company that is going to conduct an IPO, there is a, a, a registration form, Form S-1, that is the main place they have to look. Then there is a series of regulations that govern what you are allowed to, to do in the way of communications during the offering. So there is probably, you know, I would say in the SEC's books, probably 50, 50 rules, something around like that. I mean, we could certainly supplement for the record. Okay. It's, it's a pretty um, tried and true path. So. For the companies that go through an IPO, it, it, the advisors to them, I used to do this before I came to work at the SEC, there is a pretty clear path. There are handbooks that people hand out to their companies as they are thinking about going public. So it is not quite as daunting as you might think. So you would say it is adequate if there is not too many, not too few? I, I can't tell you that there is. I, I think that the, the balance is, is, is manageable. I think there are definitely a lot of rules, um, but the, the the goal here is to make sure that as companies are accessing the public markets for money, that they, that um, investors are protected enough so that they feel confident going and in investing. And, and do they, re, and do they, um, are they nimble with the times? I think that we can certainly think about that. As they were, revi we revised the offering rules very significantly in 2005. It was called Securities Offering Reform, and it was a huge overhaul. It is what, for the first time, let companies have free writing prospectuses, let them keep talking during quiet periods, let them have electronic road shows online. So it was a pretty big change, and I think it has really helped. Um, that doesn't mean we can't do more to help. So we're, we always are looking at our rules to see whether we are doing what we can to facilitate capital formation consistent with investor protection. So, so when you are looking at fraud, going back to Mr. Gowdy here, um, you know, uh, being a dentist and being a private sector aspect and, and looking at the regulations at the State, um, when there is an IPO that is a foreign base versus a, a, a U.S. predominantly based, do you see a problem or predilection within those groups of where you have to have more enforcement? I'm sorry, sir. Taking it's a, an IPO that is foreign based versus, uh, predominantly versus a U.S. or an IPO that is uh, U.S. based predominantly, do you see much more enforcement issues from one of those segments? Mm -hmm. I, I guess I would say that I think um, it depends on what markets you are looking at. There are lo there's quite a range of, of uh, requirements around the world with respect to um, the process of, of it accessing the public markets. I mean, there is no question but that the SEC in the United States has uh, one of the best developed enforcement programs and um, polices the markets. We think, you know, there is always more to do, but pretty effectively. Um, but I think other markets now um, are stepping up and doing very much the same thing, because what they understand is that to be a credible location for an IPO um, and to, for people to feel comfortable investing in new companies, there has to be a credible enforcement regime around that so that fraud is, is stopped and uh, people can have confidence in the integrity of the financial statements and the disclosures that the companies are making. So I actually think there is kind of a rising tide around the world in this regard. Well, I am worried about, more about right here in the United States. Do you see a problem more with IPOs that are with foreign based, that are predominantly foreign based or U.S. based? I think, um, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question, but, but clearly we've had um, some issues recently, and you've, I'm sure, read about them in the paper with respect to uh, reverse mergers of uh, companies whose primary operations are in China, although they may not be registered in January, they aren't registered in China and they aren't subject to the jurisdiction of the Chinese SEC, uh, and our ability um, to deal with um, the disclosure uh, shortcomings of some of those companies. So we've had a very active program at the SEC including um, suspending, um, revoking the registrations of eight Chinese companies in the last month or so and suspending the trading in just the last couple of weeks of three more of those. I, I had the opportunity yesterday to meet with the chairman of the Ch China Securities Regulatory Commission and talk about how we can establish a framework for our enforcement and examination staff to have better access to information about these companies who are not incorporated in China but whose primary operations are in China and whose auditors are in China so we can understand the quality uh, and the truthfulness of their disclosures. One real quick question. 
is there one part of the marketplace for these particular investments? I am looking at medical devices that are having some problems in which there are public offerings. Do you see any recourse or any aspects so that you are looking at one segment of the population of investors? Um, it has been interesting to me over the years to see that um, we often have fraud in whatever industry is hottest at the moment. So a number of our actions with respect to these um, companies with operations in China have been in the energy space, um, but they can be in whatever they think uh, investors will be most um, taken with at that particular moment. Well, thank you. I thank the gentleman.